I'm Matt Godbolt. And I'm Ben Rady. And this is Two's Compliment, a programming podcast. Hey, Ben. Hey, Matt. We, uh, we haven't really thought about this, have we? No, I mean, not really. We, we just said, hey, let's talk about technical debt. And then yeah. I said... Hey, Ben. And that's as far as we've got. <laughs> that's the extent of the planning. That's that is the so extent of the planning. So let's talk about technical debt. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, uh, you, you, you may know that this is a little bit... It's not hard to get me on a soapbox, as our listener is well familiar with at this point. And this is one of those things that I am very happy to uh, soapbox about, uh, which is a new verb that I invented just now. To soapbox. Um, the, I, yes. I could get behind that. Excuse me while I soapbox. Um, because I think uh, it is it is a metaphor, and it is it is something that has um, people have have lost what the original intent of this metaphor was, what the original meaning of the metaphor was, and it has become a thing that it was never intended to be. And I I think it's an actually it's a harmful thing in its current oh. sort of. Um, colloquial understanding of what it means well so why don't why don't you define technical debt from the point of view of the original idea where the, where, where does the, the term come from right well the good news is that i don't actually have to define it because ward cunningham is the guy that invented the term and he defined it and we can link a video a uh, youtube video in the show notes uh to ward's definition right he explains what it is what's the TLDR of that then. Yes, yeah, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna recount the entire video here in the podcast uh, for copyright reasons, if nothing else. But um, the the idea behind the technical debt metaphor was uh, Ward was trying to explain to people who were not programmers that their mental model of a software system would change over time. Their understanding of a problem would change over time, and you know, they would design a system for the problem as they understood it, and then that understanding would change, and then they would have to make changes to the design mm-hmm. uh, in order to accommodate that new understanding. And the difference between the current state of the system and sort of like the, uh, you know, design as it would reflect their current understanding of the problem, he referred to as debt, as technical debt. And he wanted to use that metaphor as a way to kinda, right you know tell people it's like the longer that we put this off the more expensive it gets right like we have to bring the state of the design of the system up to our current understanding of the problem otherwise it's going to get more and more expensive um, and that is quite different from the way that certainly i colloquially use the term technical debt right and and in in this video actually ward is very explicit to say at no point did i uh imply or recommend that anyone write bad code and then go fix it later right right that's not what the metaphor was intended to describe i don't think you can go faster by writing a bunch of bad code and then fixing it later i think that's a slow way to program uh this was about evolving a design as your understanding of the problem evolves and if you don't uh you know put in the time and effort to evolve that design then the cost to change your system is going to get more and more and more and more like like interest payments on a debt, right? Right. Um, I think one of the reasons why uh, Ward's original definition got lost is that very few people actually design their software that way. (laughs) (laughs) Very few people are actually, we were talking in a prior episode about incremental... I was going to say it seems to sound very yeah on theme for that. Yes, iterative, right? Like oh, we're gonna we're gonna design it the best way that we know, and then we're gonna learn more, and then we're gonna redesign it, and then we're gonna evolve the design. We're gonna use refactoring and change the design. That's a skill. It's a skill that not a lot of people have, and even the ones that have it don't necessarily use it all the time. And so, like I think the Ward's original definition is actually much more narrow in its applicability than the term is used. The term is used all the time for for basically as a as a metaphor for just, it's not a metaphor it's just like that's bad code right when people say technical debt they just mean bad code and they're not particularly specific about what they mean yeah, when they true. say that it's bad um and i think some of that is maybe hidden by the metaphor which we can talk about about 
But I, I think that's sort of like what the original definition was. I think that is Ward's original definition is a very useful definition. I think it's a little bit more narrow in scope. Very much so, yeah. And it's it's something that I you know, it's sort of like makes me wince every time I see someone use it in uh in as a as basically a, a synonym for that. Well that's code the code is bad and I don't like it. Right. And I think that's that's the thing that you were saying like prior to us recording that that is as you say, it makes you wince. It's it's when people start like building around something and saying this is technical debt and then sort of poking it with the barge pole further and further away from them and then saying like, well, we don't go there because it's, you know, it's full of technical debt. And it either gives you an excuse to ignore problems or it gives you an excuse to write even worse code mm-hmm. to keep dogpiling on because you're like, well, it's just more, te- what's more debt? You know, it's like you've already essentially technically bankrupt uh, yourself uh, and the interest, you can't keep up the interest payments. So you're like, why even bother trying? You know, I, we were just, just, yeah, just another hack on a hack. That, at least from, again, that's the colloquial yeah. understanding of technical debt here, which is not what you've just described Ward's um Right, right. Absolutely. Was. Um and I think another problem with this is that, you know, the and and I don't know I doubt very seriously that Ward anticipated all of the impacts of him just sort of coming up with this idea. Um but one of the the unfortunate negative impacts I think of this is that to most uh people who run businesses Debt is not a bad thing. Debt is a great tool, right? You you take on debt for lots of good reasons. Right. Um, so it's like, yeah, okay, advisedly. cool. We'll take on some you take it on advisedly. Right. Yeah. Uh, even if it's sometimes kind of high interest, like you know, if you're if you're starting a new venture and you need to move quickly, it's like, yeah, we'll take on a bunch of debt. Like that's fine. So like, you know, the the way that people you blend those two ideas together, right? Mm-hmm. The the misunderstanding of technical debt as bad code. And the sort of financial application of debt as a useful tool, uh, you wind up with this weird intersection, which is bad code is a good, useful tool, right? Yeah, which right. At no point does anyone who created this term even coming close to implying, right? Right. So it right. sort of like becomes this like received wisdom of technical debt, received from who, with what purpose, right? Right. Um, it's, it's, it's the worst sort of argument to th- from authority where you didn't even understand the original argument from authority. <laughs> right. It's, it's completely, there's not even like a coherent, um, thought process behind it because it's an, it's, it's, it's a phantom, uh, right. idea. No one actually made this point. It was, right, yeah. Right. But I guess it's, it's entered the zeitgeist of programmers, mm-hmm. right? Yes, it has. So we're, we're kind of stuck with it, whether Ward meant it to mean this or not. When people colloquially like nine times out of 10, if I'm talking to someone else, I'll be honest with you, I'll be making you wince by saying, you know, hey, we've got that error. Like, you know, I'm working on something right now. There are like 2,000 uh, parallel pieces of work that I'm doing across a multitude of days. There's all sorts of broken bits of data and things that I'm having to deal with. And if one or two of those things fail, I'm like kind of okay with it right now because on aggregate, that's still useful for me. Mm-hmm. And in my mind's eye, I'm like, I want to chase down every single thing. I need to understand it. For all I know, the reason that day one dies, uh, you know, crashes out is actually a systemic problem through the whole code base, right? And then it's just that it doesn't crash on the other days or whatever. Um, But in order to move forward quickly, I am, in my mind, I'm filing that under technical debt incorrectly and saying, I'm going to move on and we'll come back to it a bit later. Because, I mean, and maybe you could argue this is part of the... And I'm going to try and swing it as part of the uh, progressive. I can't remember what we came up with. Uh, iterative <laughs> way. Yeah, yeah. I want to get to the end. I want to get my 2,000 days broken or not broken, and then say, "Well, the next stage of the pipeline is to do this thing." And I think it's this, but I don't know that it's this. As in, mm-hmm. I don't even know what the design should be or what the facilities I need to pr- produce are. So I'd rather get there with some amount of like brokenness mm-hmm. to explore the space solution space of the next part and then as actually two more pit steps after that i'd rather get all the way and then go back to the beginning and go like okay these things need to be looked at now the, the these warnings that we're seeing or these crashes we're seeing are a symptom of in my mind the technical debt that i'm paying down mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but <laughs> you know you know it's so easy to, to to go like oh yeah yeah yeah, it's just bad code i don't think my code is bad it's just these are right. these are these are bugs these are issues that i've got it tracks in github or whatever, and yeah. I know I'm going to come back to them. They're just not high priority right now. And I, but they they could could be something 
that actually is really important to look down. Like, for example, I'm going to give you an example that's literally yeah. just happened right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had a, an issue with a, a, a timestamp that fast forward itself into the future. It was like 150 years in the future. Suddenly we know we're processing data from 2022 and then suddenly it's the year 2187 and you're like oh my gosh what the heck's happened here um i had seen it once and i'd filed a bug and i couldn't reproduce it and i let it sit now obviously that's kind of like there's something wrong in the system everyone mm -hmm. knows there's something wrong in the system mm -hmm. was it uh, a corrupt file for one day ever who knows right i certainly didn't at that point in time um and then we let it lie uh you know it happened again one more time we put added something to it but no one really tracked it down and then today we had a completely unconnected issue where we ran out of disk space and the mm -hmm. reason it turns out now we know that we ran out of disk space is that some poor process was trying to fill in all of the gaps between 2018 and 2187 with with just empty data because it's like oh well you know uh, mm -hmm. I have to do like a forward fill of all of this data and it ran out of disk space doing so understandably and of course then we're like oh Wait a second, where have I seen the year 21? Oh, I know, this is that bug. And all this time, that has been sat there. And actually, we've processed other data incorrectly. So we found the problem, we fixed it. And now we're cursed to actually go back and, and reconvert a whole bunch of data, which is, you know, expensive. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that did not pay off. <laughs> that that, right, um, that right. came back to haunt me. Um, but sometimes it doesn't right and may am i right to you know stop and drop and do everything every time i don't know where, no where no 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 and, and so the here's here's the thing about this is that this the problem the reason i wince is not because i'm trying to advocate that everyone should do everything perfectly all the time for some definition of perfectly that's not what i'm saying at all what I'm saying is, is that why are we using this broken, misaligned metaphor right. to talk Don't about things that. that we as programmers can be much more specific about and have right. much more precise terminology about? Because when I hear you say this is technical debt, that doesn't really align with the other things that I see people call technical debt. Because yeah. at least in my mind, those are, those are very different things with very different impacts on the system and the reliability of the system and the long-term viability and the pro everything else. And so... The, the ways that I kind of, the dimensions that I think about when it comes to these sorts of things, and this is something that has definitely been evolving in my mind over the last few years. You know, it's not, this is not like some, you know, uh, received wisdom is, oh, everybody knows this has been around a long time. I, I, I've, been tr I've been trying to like say, okay, Ben, well, if technical debt is not the right way to think about it, then what is? And the more modern thinking that I have on this is that you should think of your system in terms of uh, complexity uh its capabilities and its risks and so what i hear you describing here is actually just a risk there's a mm -hmm. risk in yes. the system that is unaddressed yep and it can make very good sense not to address all of your risks i mean this is true in every endeavor of engineering right they don't Somewhere. make you know yeah. bridges that are like impossible to fall over because they would be cost prohibitive right there's a certain standard that they design to, and they say that it is, you know, it's going to fail under these conditions, or it's going to fail after this amount of time if it hasn't been maintained. And there are, you know, risks that that you carry um, in the operation and the and the construction of that bridge, and those are deemed to be acceptable for whatever um, application it is that you're doing. And it's no different in software, right? So mm -hmm. you have risks that are in your system, and it is right and proper for you to make a backlog of those risks and account for them. But it's not necessarily right to just always fix all of them as soon as you possibly can. Right. Right? Um, so that's one dimension, right? Yeah, and that is yeah, a very yeah. different thing than technical debt. Than but technical again, debt, right. That gets right. lumped in to in oh, the we same... talk about this metaphor of technical debt, and it means basically bad code. And what it means is, oh, it's a risk that we have. You know, if the disk fills up, if this problem occurs, if we see this exception we've never seen before, whatever, right? So that's one thing. Yeah. Another thing is capabilities, just new features, new functionality. Now, I, I've <laughs> definitely used the term capabilities more and more uh, working where I do because features mean something totally different. <laughs> I mean, features means about three different things to three other three people within yeah, our right, organization. Right. So, yeah, capabilities and facilities and whatever. We all yeah. come up with, like, alternative. Functionality, uh, yeah, well, right. Uh -huh. Similarly, for what it's worth, um, we always talk about, you know, if you talk about the uh, – if you sort an, uh, an array of things, they are ordered – but if we talk about, you know, the ordering or the order or, you know, what order are they in? Um, again, in our world, 
order means something else. There's an order. Yeah, is a, right. an, so I always say sequence now. Are they sequenced in this way? Are they, you know, yeah, so you yeah, kind of yeah. learn these ways of avoiding ambiguity <laughs> in your day to day based on the sort of colloquial expressions that are more common than the perhaps, yeah, more common yeah. in general English ways. Yeah, anyway. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I mean, the facilities. Yes. Facilities, no, capabilities. Yes. The capabilities. capabilities, right. It's the things that your software is capable of doing. Yeah. Right? And you're going to have gaps in those capabilities. Sometimes those gaps actually represent risks, like, oh, if this thing happens, then we won't handle it and it'll crash. Yeah. Sometimes the gaps in the capability is just like, yeah, we just don't do that yet, right? That's not something that the system does for you, right? Literally before coming, you know, I know we said about this bug we found, but I was adding the capability of our cache directory to have a maximum size, which at the moment mm -hmm. it doesn't. And uh, we've been working around it by every now and then you just rm minus rf slash temp slash, you know, my cache, whatever. And we're like, we're kind of been fine with that. That's a capability we could live without, but it's annoying. Mm -hmm. And now you go, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, we can... Mm -hmm. Add that capability. So that's that's fine. And yeah, all right, okay. Mm -hmm. Capabilities. And then the third thing is complexity. Now, we've, oh. I think we've talked before in the show yeah. about complexity, necessary complexity versus unnecessary complexity. Um, I think it's good to minimize unnecessary complexity, but I think the thing that you really just sort of want to be looking at is the total complexity. Whether it's necessary, whether it's unnecessary, it's still there. It still makes your code harder to understand. Harder to change. Right. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's perfectly designed and is the absolute minimum thing that it could possibly be. It's still complex. Yeah. That still has yeah. costs, right? Absolutely, yeah. And so these are the three three dimensions of software that I, I, I kind of think about. And I try to, whenever I think about technical debt, I try to think about, okay, is this a risk? Is this missing uh, capabilities? Is this complexity? Like, what is this more specifically? I don't need to use a metaphor, a financial metaphor to reason about this. I'm a programmer. I'm talking to other programmers. I can be more concrete. You can right? say these things, yeah. And you're yeah. right. A lot of those things. So what I'm hearing from you is that um, some of the, I mean, because we can make up a straw this definition of what other people think technical debt is in a second, mm -hmm. because I think that would be right. useful. But right, what you're now is saying is like within at least the people we talk to, when people say technical debt, debt, they're probably better served by thinking of it in one of those three categories, uh, mm -hmm. because we're assuming they don't mean my code is just terrible and that's okay. Which is right. the other, again, now this is the straw man. Well, I would it's put like, that in unnecessary complexity. Right? I it mean, was... yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I could make an argument that, that just complexity of its own is not necessary. You know, there is, while bad code can be unnecessarily complicated, it can also just be simple and bad and wrong. Hmm. Well, yeah, you know, okay. sometimes you have to add complexity to make uh, make it better. You know, yeah. like, hey, I've got no, this really true. simple Bash script, and this Bash script is, uh, you know, and you're like, but that's why are you doing it in Bash? You're like, well, it's because it's three lines of Bash, and you're like, but if it, there's no monitoring, there's no there's no email if it goes down, that I can't parallelize it, I can't, all these things. I guess those are capabilities and things like that, but it's not bad. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Now, you're, you, you, listener, Ben is <laughs> grinning the I told you so grin at me right now. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm bringing all these things up. Again, this is something that I have, uh, I have been thinking about for a while. And I don't know that I'm not trying to actually say that this is some new comprehensive way to think about it. I'm just I'm trying to figure out a replacement. Like, I for know it, that right. technical deck is wrong. And I keep thinking about like, okay, how can I be more well, precise about this, right? I mean, f first of all, um, I sh we should note that Perry has just made his first podcast appearance. Oh, has he? Yeah, he's behind you right now. So Ben's dog came in. I'm sure I saw it. I'm, I did not invent that. Maybe he left I mean, he, did he walk back out again? I, mean, yeah, I didn't notice him go out, but yeah. I, thought, I was ah. like, hey, it's Perry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've had Monty make a debut, although he's asleep he's behind me. Desk. Uh, is he not no all right now yeah, i've just made you look around somewhere in here i don't know anyway um i've yeah. now forgot what we were talking about well it's um, it's you know can can am i is uh i'm trying to find new tests for my hypo, uh my scientific theory here right I'm, all my right hypothesis is that you can categorize you can take what currently falls into the very vague category of technical debt and actually a little bit broader than that, the sort of like the aspects of software that you need to care about when you think about technical debt and like good code versus bad code and things like that right, and right, fit right. them into one of three categories. Is it a risk? Is it a capability? Or is it complexity? And complexity has a necessary and an unnecessary component right. to it, right? Got it. Um, 
And I will say that like for me on the projects that I'm working on right now, these things are actually fairly directly measurable, right? If you want to see my risks, go look in the issue backlog. All the yeah. risks that we know about are in there, right? Yeah. If you want to see the current implemented capabilities, look at the tests. All the tests describe all the capabilities of the system, and you can see what they all are, right? If you want to know the missing capabilities, well, that's probably also in the issue in backlog. In the issue tracker, yeah. And if you want to know what the complexity is, you can do a lot worse than just counting the number of lines of code. <laughs> like, there are other more sophisticated ways to say, measure but, complexity in code. But it's not a bad proxy. It's not a bad measurement of complexity, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, fair. fair. Uh, and so that's sort of the way that I, I, I think about it. We think about, like, the, okay, we could mitigate this risk, mm -hmm. but is it worth the complexity? Yeah. Right? Maybe it's better just to wear the risk. And, like, even if it happens once, it's like, yeah, you know, it crashed. We turned it back on again wasn't great yeah this is a, a bit like that sort of pragmatic thing where if you, if you can't write a test for it make it fail fast you know like there's a there's a yeah. trade-off there it's like i could spend a ton of complexity testing the every command line parameter to my command line tool mm -hmm. or the first time anyone notices that we that dash dash whatever doesn't work anymore is like we go fix it i mean again right. you don't want to yeah yeah right because so, because i feel like unless you have those ways to discuss the trade-offs what you wind up getting into is this sort of like semantic argument about like oh that's technical debt it's terrible and you're like no that's just a reasonable trade-off and it's like mm -hmm. what are you trading off right like if you can't describe that if you can't enumerate that it sort of falls into this vague definition of it's just bad and i don't like it yeah right? yeah and there's a lot of yeah we've we've, we've talked about fud sort of before mm -hmm. about you know there's a lot of fear uncertainty doubt you can use it as kind of like one of those words but once you've painted it with that it's like you you know it's just it's just bad unequivocally mm -hmm. bad mm -hmm. um but one thing that's I think I think missing, and maybe this is maybe you're, you you got to I could imagine maybe you're a talk to this, but like is there is something really emotive, which is perhaps the problem with the term technical debt, because I think everybody, even when you're talking about engineering stuff, everyone can kind of get your head around the fact that debt has a compounding aspect mm -hmm. to it, and not all of the things that you said have a compounding aspect to them. No, that's right? true. Yeah. Missing capabilities don't necessarily have a compounding aspect. It's like, oh, I mean, they could do. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the uh, risks could be compounding. You could imagine a risk which is like, well, if that happens, then oh, now all these other things become really important. You know, suddenly, like, you know, if you can't if you can't reproducibly recreate all your data from scratch, then this this bug that you have that you've seen once that can corrupt a file might be very very a big a big deal because suddenly you might have to go through you know hundreds of thousands of terabytes of you know data again or whatever right that can mm -hmm. compound but almost always code complexity has a sort of in your face day on day yes. uh compounding effect where it's like yeah i want to add a new capability oh but the code is too complex right. and it's sort of like it gets worse and worse and worse because it's like what you're really talking about is sort of entropy of the code base mm -hmm. and it just it, it gets worse on its own somehow right you could go back to a project from two years ago and somehow it's worse than you left it you know mm -hmm. bit rot is real yeah um yeah so yeah it feels like that there's sort of some and again it's emotive rather than like uh, you know i can't put my finger on it as you, as you say if we're talking about professionals talking to professionals i think we all understand that that is already present if i just say yeah look, the code is unnecessarily complicated you can say yeah i guess that makes it a pain to change you're like Certainly does, and you know, yeah. like that, that, you know, right. Well, we don't have to say, but it's a debt, right? But right. it does, yeah. But it's so easy; it's a trap to fall into. I mean, it I, is, I can. It yeah. is. A, it is a trap to fall into, and I think if you go back to Ward's original definition and think about what he was actually talking about, he was talking about unnecessary complexity in my model, right? Mm -hmm. He was talking about like the problem has our understanding of the problem has evolved beyond the current design. There are things in the current design that don't fit that problem and it could be like you know literally just code that isn't used anymore it could be designs that really aren't um applicable for the problem that they're trying to solve and you sort of like twist them around to try to get it to work and it's just adding a bunch of things that you just don't need and the solution to that or, or a way to address that is maybe uh -huh. a better way to think about it um is to refactor the code so that the design better fits the problem that you have and 
hopefully just sort of shrink the number of lines, but at a minimum, just make them easier to understand, right? Yeah. And again, this sort of gets back to my thing of like, that is a very narrow thing. Ward was talking about a very specific type of unnecessary complexity mm -hmm. where the design has not evolved along with the understanding of the problem. There is an opportunity to remove some unnecessary complexity, right? right? Uh, very narrow. But that, I mean, you're absolutely right to hit on the, the fact that, that complexity, period, is compounding, right? Here's a thought experiment for you. Let's say that you have a, uh, well, have we, done, have we done the Alice and Bob and going to the park? Have we talked? I'm just going to say this again. Forgive me, for, dear listener. If this is if a I repeat, I, this, it doesn't ring a bell for me, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm if still I have mildly hungover, uh, as yeah. you may have picked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right there with you. Um, so you have, let's say that you, you accidentally give uh, you know, two programmers on a team the same problem on the same day, right? Uh, Alice and Bob. And, uh, you know, they're not sending cryptic messages to each other and, right, in this no. particular example, and nope. no one is trying to intercept it or whatever, nope, but they're nope, just nope. two regular just two programmers, programmers on your team, and you trying say, to solve hey. a problem, and they accidentally are both trying to solve the same problem at the same time, not Got knowing it. that the other person is working on it. And so Bob sits down and he writes a thousand lines of code to solve this problem. And this code is perfectly designed, it is as simple as it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. It is well tested. It is well designed. Uh, it is correctly documented. So whatever level of documentation is appropriate for this project, right. please apply that level of documentation. Um, <laughs> and it solves the problem perfectly. And he spends all day on on working that. At the end of the day, he you know pushes his changes into a PR and sends the PR to Alice, saying like, "Hey, can you please review this?" And then <laughs> meanwhile, Alice, meanwhile, while all this is going on. Alice goes to the park and she sits in the park and she feeds the pigeons and she thinks about the problem and she sits there all day feeding the pigeons and thinking about the problem and she comes back to the office at like 4.30 and she deletes three lines of code and pushes a PR fixing the same problem that Bob fixed. <laughs> Which of those two, two solutions is better? I mean, the one that involves sitting in the park is better just... For, you know, but, Obviously, but yeah. Alice's solution is better. Right? Yeah. There's yeah, no yeah, yeah. unnecessary complexity in Bob's solution. None. Other than the fact that he just wasn't really solving the right problem. He didn't understand that the way to fix this is to just not do these three things yeah, instead yeah, yeah. of accounting for... And I think we can all think of things that fall into that, that kind of category of like, you know, this is a perfect solution to... So, he, you know, for example, we just talked about this, like the cache that I'm talking about here is a big mm -hmm. cache for these giant files that I download from wherever or whatever. And the three-line fix really if i had access to the code that i needed would be just read the files directly from the network appliance don't download them to the cache and then manage the manager cache and so like here i am i'm adding adding complexity here to deal with mm -hmm. the the problem that i've created myself whereas if somebody was smarter than me and could work out how to get the the just would yeah exactly you, you you're with me you're with me on this mm -hmm. and, and yeah it's I, I like to think of this as the uh the old lady who swallowed a fly you know, the children's mm. rhyme. Yeah. And, you know, she swallowed a fly, perhaps she'll die. And then she swallows a spider to catch the fly. And we're all, we've all written spider level fixes for mm -hmm. something, right? You know, like, there's this thing, I didn't think about it, uh, but I can solve it by, by swallowing a spider. And then, you know, the, 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 the tale continues until she's swallowing a horse. And I think at that point, you really you should be fired actually if you're considering <laughs> swallowing all, 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 all but you know it takes it there's a lot of inertia because there's a lot of code that's written in the horse the cow the dog the cat i'm trying to remember now <laughs> the cat the frog <laughs> the spider i don't know whatever it was that she swallowed to swallow the fly and then what you really want to do is go back and say back in time as we can as developers and say let's just not swallow the fly in the first place right and now we're good <laughs> right and that's right. alice there or you know, and, and getting back to my sort of Alice Bob uh, hypothetical scenario, one way that that could very practically p play out is what Alice was thinking about in the park is, is it really bad if we swallow a fly? Because maybe we could avoid this whole thing by just taking on a very small risk that is yeah. a completely acceptable risk yeah. and is totally better than a another thousand lines of code. Yeah. So I'm just going to go delete these three lines and there's a chance we'll swallow a fly and turns out that's just a little bit extra protein, and we'll all be fine. 
Yeah, maybe that's yeah. So that's an even better analogy then. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, just deal with it. You swallow the fly. All right. Yeah. Restart the server once it's every fine. three months or whatever, Ex- rather than the yeah. Well, we've got this thing that follows this. You know, that you've seen like this um, sipping bird. You know those sipping bird things that mm-hmm. like you you kind of heat up and then they kind of like keep dipping forward. There was I, I, if I think it was at Google. A whole thing with that which was the, the thing at the very end of the chain that kind of like um causes everything to continue running is the sipping bird that's hitting like the space bar on the computer <laughs> console that's like yeah 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 carry on whatever it doesn't matter just you know somewhere along the line of complexity this rube goldberg <laughs> machine that you've built you're like something has to be physically at the server pressing the button <laughs> and yeah. you, could, you could do worse than a little sipping bird now that we've gone all over the place with that but yeah yeah that's a really powerful thought is that like the the the, the fact that you could be trading a very small risk for a ton of complexity mm-hmm. and say i'm taking on this very small risk and i'm fine with it actually yeah it's all right yeah. you know what i'm not going to worry about what happens if you run out of disk space um and all of the cleanup code that might go with it i'm just like well if it happens we'll get paged that's fine. Or the, the, that particular process will die. The machine will get recycled. The new one will come up and we're going to look for why that happened. But we don't have to have proactive, like f- cash, whatever, you know, <laughs> just again, top of mind for me. So I'm going to keep drawing on what I've yeah, been yeah, yeah. doing the last couple of hours. No, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing that you can do with this, we were talking about trading off, like, how do you get rid of complexity, right? This is the thing that feeds on itself. This is the thing that makes it harder and harder to add stuff. Yes, we want to eliminate accidental complexity, what a lot of people would say is technical debt, what Ward was talking about with that very narrow definition there. Okay. Yes, we want to get rid of that. But sometimes the only way to make this better is to get rid of essential complexity, and that's by changing the problem. Hmm. Everyone has seen like the Kanban board or the task board or the JIRA, whatever. Here's all the 75 things that we need to do, right? What percentage of those things are remove this feature? Yeah, that's never a. It's never oh, on that very board. Rarely, very rarely. Very, very. I it's, have one right now, but it's mostly a. I, I we migrated the system, and then we should get rid of the the old system. And you know how long that has been kicked down the can? About one, you know, three months now. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's not still not really important enough to get rid of, even though. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or or, what you or preach, maybe even Bolt. more so. Here <laughs> are all the features that are not carrying their complexity wake weight. They're useful. They're valuable to somebody, but we've decided that, you know what, the 10,000 lines of code that we have in our system that supports this one feature yeah. that is not worth it is going to be removed. And there's been the you know conversation with the group or the person, whoever it is that likes this thing. It's like, I'm sorry. I know you like this. Here's this alternative that we wrote for you in 12 lines of bash. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not as good, but it does the job. But it does the job. And more it will importantly, save us. Yeah this giant chunk of complexity headache. that i mean you know a, a not totally off way to think about these kinds of things in terms of managing complexity is again regardless of whether it's accidental or essential or whatever is imagine if every time you want to add a line of code to your system you had to read log base 10 uh of the lines in your system right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you can you can very easily and quickly see how you're going to get slower and slower and slower and slower the more stuff that you add. Yeah, and yeah. so thinking about how you're going to manage that complexity and thinking about what tools you have in your arsenal for getting rid of it. Obviously, getting rid of accidental complexity, great. If you find it, get rid of it. If you find code yep. that you don't need anymore, delete it. If you find things that are too complicated, can be simplified, great, do that. But you have more tools than that, right? And you need to use them because if you don't, what will eventually happen is your system will turn into a haunted graveyard. Uh, it will turn into the thing that everyone is scared to touch. Like, oh, don't go there. Every time you make a change to that thing, it breaks because nobody right. understands how it works anymore. Right, 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 right. And then people are like, well, we just need to rewrite it, right? And then you rewrite it and then the cycle begins anew. <laughs> <laughs> Like and you have a whole phoenix a new from the ashes of the previous yes. system with all exactly. the same flaws, I mean, right? How, uh, dear listener, how many times have you seen in your career the phenomena of the old system that has turned into the haunted graveyard that nobody wants to touch, and then they bring in a new person to maintain it, or maybe a whole two team, and they look at it for a few months and they're like, "The solution here is a rewrite. We're going to rebuild it." 
Yeah. And then they rebuild it, and then five years later, the exact same thing has occurred. I can right? think. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we actually, we turned it around. Uh, we, so uh, one of the things that I've seen happen a number of times is that if you've got a, 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 fe- a, a facility that is sort of not exactly required, you know, maybe it's a visualization tool or a monitoring tool or, in, in our case, a simulator for something, then uh, that's when the you know, junior folks come in and you say, hey, we're going to rewrite it again. Um, and you get to do it as a way of learning how we do software development here, or we're going to write it in a new language that we're just trying out here. And if it, you know, we know that we're going to rewrite it again in another year's time because we always do. So at least in that way, you're kind of capitalizing on the idea that this 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 thing is essentially yeah, yeah, yeah. permanently cursed. <laughs> right. Yes. It it's, is just it's, it's 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 a haunted house on purpose, right? You know. It's, yeah, it's like the Halloween haunted the, house where you yeah. go there and just a fun time. Oh, it's meant to be like this. I see. Yeah. Okay, right. You know, oh, we writ- we wrote it in you know Scala. Have we got right. anything else written in Scala? No, it was just seemed like a fun thing to do, and we're going to rewrite it again anyway. So, gosh, Scala, um, that that is scary. <laughs> Let's not offend anyone who. who... <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, it's true that 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 certainly. Um, larger code bases in particular suffer from this or larger mm-hmm. er, you know, areas, especially when you know you mentioned something about like, hey, this is this code even used or is it used by one thing once or is there a test? You know, we've all seen code bases that grow and grow and grow and nobody has culled out the stuff that isn't used. And if you're not careful, you find that if, if you're very lucky, you find the only use is the test that tests the functionality. And then you ask yourself, well, it apparently is used, but it's used by a test. Um, right, does right. anyone other than the test use it? No. Do we really need it? Um, because it's it is a bit of a millstone now with all the automatic refactoring tools that we've got, it's a little bit easier to carry around unused code, a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. But in in the old days, should we say, of like greps and finds and replaces, the more chances of hitting things that you don't need, um, the, sorry, the the more um, the larger your code base with unnecessary mentions of things that maybe or may sound like the thing that you're trying to change, the more likely you are to get like collateral damage of hitting, you know, your regex hits, renames the wrong variable or whatever, or you forget to update one case of it or any of things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think even with the refactoring tools, there's a cost there because the tree of dependencies uh, isn't shaped the way that you want. If you've got some piece of code that's unused, so nothing yep. calls it, right? It can still call lots of other things. Yeah, and by that's doing true. so, it puts a constraint on what those things can yeah. be. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Right? Yeah. I mean, how many times have you had this thing where you're sort of like, wow, well, I really want to change this return type, but I, if I do, it's going to screw. So what do you? What calls that? What calls that? What calls Nothing! Nothing calls yeah. this! This whole <laughs> yeah. chain is... The, why have yeah. I spent the last half an hour looking through yeah. this code? Right? I could have just changed it as soon as I saw it, right? Yeah, that's um, true. So, uh, yeah, the, you, uh, that, that unused code... And I mean, you know... You say it's sort of like, you know, do we need to keep it? It's like, well, you've, you've already kept it. If you're looking at it, there's a very good chance it's in your source control. And, and then you can go and get it. But actually so, quite difficult to remove from the source control. So, But, but, but then, you know, uh, the, the counter to that, and this is a weak counter, I think, just thinking out loud, really. Um, the counter to that is that if it is in source control, it is stagnant. Yeah, if you come true. back to it that like three true. months yeah. later and go, didn't we have a thing that did the, the other stuff? And then you find that it doesn't work anymore. But then what you're trading off is the cost of the of the incrementally keeping a piece of code up to date and the transitive closure of things that use it or have been used by it. Right. That maybe is like a, a null set or maybe is a large set of things, but they're just inconsequential and they actually hurt you. Right. That's yeah. one cost against the speculative cost of if we were to remove it and then have to resurrect it talking of haunted graveyards and Mm -hmm. things again right yeah if you do need to resurrect uh this this uh piece of code and functionality you might have to do a little bit of surgery there and then that Mm -hmm. seems often like that might not be as bad as it sounds now, obviously, if everything's changed under your feet, it's no longer a li- you know, version 7 of this library. is now version 94, and, and the, the whole API is gone, and you don't know what you're doing with it anymore. But maybe, yeah, it's very subjective, I guess. It depends on the thing. But, like, yeah, again, this is a risk or a trade-off that we're <laughs> talking about at the beginning of this. Like, what's the risk? If I take this out, there is a risk that we may need it in future. And you could actually say, I'm removing this capability mm-hmm. right. and trading off for the risk that we might need it again in some indeterminate amount of time, and maybe I can wear that risk. Mm-hmm. And in doing so, I have removed some essential complexity because it's essential because it supports a capability that we say that we needed. Yeah. But I'm trading off a risk. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. 
And I think there's another bet that you're making there when you keep that code because you think you might need it one day, which is your option is delete it and recover it from source control at some point in the future when you decide you need it again, mm -hmm. or keep it and pay the cost to maintain it through all the transitions of all the other code between now and then, right? Yep. It is entirely possible that the work to reincorporate it in the future will be smaller than yeah, each than the, individual change than that the, you have to make. the integral of the area around right. the graph. Because you might were. change it one way and then change it back the other way and yeah. then change it one way and then change it back the other way. And if you could just hop from the beginning to the end, it would actually be way cheaper, right? Yeah. And it's hard to say. And so, like, yeah. you know, for me personally, if there's code in the code base that isn't used, unless I, like, know, like, I'm working on this next week. I'm going to add this capability in next, tomorrow, the day after, right? Like, it's, it's going to be there, like, it, it's the next thing in my list, you know what I mean? Yeah, right, right. So unless it's something like that, I'm going to delete it every time. Because I know it's in source control. I'll know I'll bring it back. There's a very good chance that when I bring it back, it'll actually be easier to reintegrate. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, I can sort of reevaluate the capability in the context of the new design, right? Like, I can be like, okay, this is the capability I want. Here's some code that does it. Actually, now I only want these, like, eight lines. Okay. And I'm going to put them over here a instead of where of they a, were before. A step back from, from it, a little yeah. chance to reevaluate it in, in the light of new evidence instead of the incremental, like, well, I'm just keeping the test passing aspect of it that maybe yeah. you were doing before, which is not as thoughtful as... Uh, as a sort of intentional, you know, as the okay. Now I, I've I've got it in front of me, and I can make it fit the design as it sees as it is now, as it, as it has evolved in one step rather than the thousands of paper cuts along the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I don't know, but this is this is kind of my 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 proposed replacement for technical debt. It's, and this is again when you're talking from when you're talking to programmers. When programmers are talking right. to programmers. They don't need to use metaphors. If you want to keep using technical debt with your boss because he knows what it means and you know what it means and you have a common understanding of what it means, that's fine. I'm not telling you not to do that. But if we're talking about code, we can be more precise. We can talk about risks. We can talk, talk about capabilities, functionality, whatever you want to call it. We can talk about complexity. I think every programmer uh, suffers at that, right? Suffers from that. Yeah. Um, and we can talk about the trade-offs between those things. Yeah. Right? Because sometimes those trade-offs really make sense to make. Yeah, no, no, it makes a lot of sense to me. I was just about to make an argument for one of the few places where I see complexity budgets being spent in places where you wouldn't expect them to be, but it's still essential complexity, is in high-performance code. But I think that's mm. just a capability. You know, the, the, the capability of, like, processing something in a certain uh, amount of time. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was going to say, but performance is another category. But no, I think we can qu quite reasonably call it a capability, you know, or like yeah. a, 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 a sort of constraint, a design constraint on the system. Mm -hmm. It must be able to do X. And you can say it must be able to do X in Y or with latency lower than whatever. Um, you know, we've all seen those bits of code, right? You know, the, the beautiful, oh, yeah. the beautiful, uh, you know, design where you've got every little object that has its own little responsibility. And then ultimately you go down and say, no, it just needs to be super quick. I'm just going to sit down and write the very complicated <laughs> thing with all, with this yes. more comment than it is code because yes, I'm explaining yes. why we're not calling this whatever and we're mm -hmm. resuming X. Uh, yeah. And then you're yeah. like, this is costly. And at the far extreme of that, actually, I was giving a, um, a chat at lunchtime uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was walking through some of my 90, late 90s era Dreamcast code which includes some Hitachi SH4 assembly code as well and it's like <laughs> wow. you know like, you've seen my code you yeah. know that I tend not to um, I tend not to uh, uh, comment that much I, I rely on like ver useful variable names and function names and extracting but like when you're writing assembly you've kind of got no choice and so it was just a wash with this prose about what I'm doing how it's doing why this allocation's like this why the format's like whatever and it was going like why is it so well commented and I'm like well because it's so complicated and then I said the problem with this though is that like if someone turns around to me and says can you make it do X? I'll be like, no, I can't. Yeah, it's, right. you know, this is a huge deal now and it's hard to change. And that's the yeah, complexity. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's a complete yeah. aside. I guess, I, you know, we're looking at the time. We should probably, uh, I think we've oh, reached yeah. a natural conclusion here. Yeah, I, think I think you've, we, you've, I think you've said have. what you need to say about this, which is that like technical <laughs> I, debt is probably not what you think it is mm -hmm. unless you're Ward Cun Cunningham or Ben Rady. <laughs> and now maybe anyone who's listened to, to this, this podcast 
Yeah. Maybe it's excusable to colloquially refer to kind of any NAF bit of the code base for whatever reason as technical debt to mm -hmm. non-technical folks. Yeah. Um, but it's probably, no, it's not probably, it is definitely more useful to describe it in a more specific term. And you're, you're, uh, when you're talking to other programmers and it's either a, a risk, a capability, or uh, complexity. And those are the things that, that, you, that you are knowingly trading between and the yeah that makes sense mm -hmm. i like this that is, this is what i'm aspiring to do i mean i still use the term technical debt like it's 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 something where it's like i catch myself and i'm like can you be more precise about this ben can you can you describe what you're trying to say better? is this when you have your one-on-ones with yourself <laughs> in the shower that's yeah, yeah. And that is where, that is the place where most of the the real deep thinking happens isn't it it's like you're just the right yes. side of, of of wakefulness but not yet fully booted up right. and you've not had the coffee or anything like that and uh -huh. you're, you've got no other distractions and yeah it's like a meditation isn't it that's when you really these things happen. or sitting in the park next to alice all right yeah we're <laughs> feeding the ducks with alice all right that sounds like a perfect place for us to finish yeah. cool see you next time bye You've been listening to Two's Compliment, a programming podcast by Ben Rainey and Matt Godbold. Find the show transcripts and notes at www.twoscompliment.org. Contact us on Mastodon. We are at twoscompliment at pachyderm.io. Our theme music is by Inverse Phase. Find out more at inversephase.com.